So Jamie, it's good, good to have you back. It's been Thanks a while. Me. Good to be here. Yeah, it has been a while. Uh, COVID, was, COVID was a bit of a tricky one for me trying to get over. Um, before that, it was coming over every six weeks or so, sometimes yeah. four weeks. Um, I came back twice in November last year, but my second trip home, I got COVID on the way home. So I couldn't get my booster shot, so I wasn't able to travel. Yeah. So I was able to get my booster shot only last Friday. Um, and I came over straight away. Yeah. Well, it's really good having you back. It's like you never left. I haven't seen you for years. <laughs> it's been a while, all right. But we've caught up this morning and like it was yesterday. It was really funny. Yeah. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So, Jamie, obviously, this is Hustle Kitchen Podcast. And I like to talk a bit of business, a uh, bit of marketing, a bit of everything. Yeah. Right? So, when we first met, obviously, it was a much smaller business. Yeah, yeah. It was a long time ago for Bab Saudi. Yeah. Bab Saudi, yeah. And, like, it's grown quite a bit now. Yeah. And I gotta say, like I gotta give it to you. No, neither you nor Barry live here. No, not for- anymore. But we have. What I did was before we left, we got a really good GM in place. Um, Sangeeta, she's from Australia. She's been with us, I think, seven years now. And it's funny when we let we Barry and I were here. I think it was nine years, and we were trying so hard to grow the business and just doing everything we thought was right. And then Sangeeta comes along and says, "No, let's change this. Let's change this." And about 18 months after we moved home, she doubled the size of the business. That's amazing. It is amazing, but it's not amazing for me to look at if you think about it. But I have learned loads from Sangeeta, and in Ireland as well, we've a new operations director there. Um, Barry and I were very old school, KPIs, being at nine, go home at five. And life has changed a lot now. Um, Life had changed, but we hadn't caught up with it, but we have caught up with it now. And it's more about, is everyone happy? I think if everyone's happy, everything gets done. Yeah. Um, I think if you're pushing people and they're not happy in a business, yeah. they move on and the work only gets half done. Yeah. Um, if you hire the right people and trust them, uh, let them do their thing. I, th- I think that's a very inter- interesting point because like, you know, for all of us, I, you know, when we start, come to Bahrain, start a business or go to any country yeah. and you feel like stuck in that country because you're like, you have a business now and like, oh, I, I wish I could go back to Australia, yeah. but then what would happen to what's going on here? I know, I know. That, that thought was always in my head when I left back home. Um, I went home for family reasons. Uh, my, um, my dad's getting old. My kids were going into secondary school um, back in Ireland and my wife wanted to go home. So when I moved home, I was kind of going, oh my God, I can't believe this is my baby. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I spent nine, ten years building it. And then I moved home and then like just every week we called St. Gita and you just said, this is getting better, this is getting better. And you just going, oh, it's probably a good move. <laughs> <laughs> Taking yourself out yeah. of the business made it grow. <laughs> and then we, I've literally put in a lot of what I've learned from St. Gita and Mark back home. I put that into the business now. And I think I'm a people person, but I was following the old rules of running a business. And yeah. I don't think they work anymore. I know a lot of businesses still do it. Um, I just run the business the way I'd like to be run myself. Yeah. And I think that's just been one of my successes. What do you, when you say the old way of running business, you mean like a very corporate structure yeah. style? Corporate structure, KPIs, like telling people what they should do. But look, I, I see it a lot in LinkedIn. Richard Branson said there's no point hiring really good people and telling them what to do. Yeah. Hire good people and let them tell you what to do. Yeah. And it is, it really, really does work. I know people might go, oh, it's very cliche or whatever. Yeah. But it, it does actually work. Mm. You know, I'm not one of these people who likes all these soul, body, and mind stuff and all these wisdom quotes. Um, I do read them, but I just personally, I think my whole thing is, look, this needs to be done. Let's get it done. Yeah. How do we figure out to get it done? Yeah. And just go from there. So it's all target driven and, and not the way you get there. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's just like, th- this is what we need to do together. How can we accomplish it? Rather than me going this is what I think we should do, so let's do it. Yeah. Um, it's just one person's decision isn't enough nowadays. Yeah. It's, it's a team environment. Yeah. Because I find if your team's involved with all the decisions you make, they're, they want to do it themselves. Whereas if you're telling someone what to do, they're not as keen to do it. That is true. Um, so yes, it's all team environment. You guys help me. We'll all work together. So it's a, it's a big like trust factor as well. Huge trust factor, yeah. Um, it has to be a trust factor, especially that I'm living at home a lot more now. Um, I need to trust everyone that's here and they just need, I need to be able to trust their decisions. If there's a problem, we'll hear about it, we'll discuss it and we'll figure out how to yeah. fix it. Because like, we don't live in a perfect world, we all make mistakes. Yeah. So that's why pencils have rubber as they say. So, so you've made some mistakes. <laughs> to be, I think, Shocker. I know, yeah. I think 
for anyone, like I remember being in an interview years ago and I was asked, have you ever failed? And I was like, no, no, no. <laughs> You'd be scared but to now, answer yeah, that Yeah, question, you would right? be. But nowadays you're there going, yeah, I have failed loads. That's why I'm sitting where I am today. Yeah. I think if people will always fail. Yeah. It depends on how they get back up and how they take the next step. You know, it's really interesting because in, in the States, like, you know, they say with venture capitalists and VCs for the, in the startup world, yeah. like, if you haven't had a failure, they won't invest in you. Yeah. You know, it's, it's it. like something to take pride in. You know, like, oh, you've never had a failure? But We're not giving you money. But it's true. <laughs> and I met people in business where, I met one guy once, he was an Irish guy in Dubai. Um, he's just, he set up this um, business, I can't remember what it was, and it was just strength, and strength, and strength, and he was a millionaire within a few years. And then he run. He never failed. Yeah. And then he ran into two or three complications, and that was it. Him, he was gone. He didn't know how to do it. After. How to deal with it? I think the bounce back every day. Like not well, hopefully not every day, but like you need to fail quite a lot in business. And I think anyone who turns around and says they haven't failed, they're not as successful as they think they are. Okay. Or they have failed those and they haven't realized. So, it. what would you say was your biggest failure then? Ooh, my biggest failure. Um, a lot of failures at setting up Propel. I made a lot, a lot of mistakes. Unfortunately, in the beginning, I didn't learn from a lot of them. Mm. Um, but as time has gone on, I've learned to learn from my mistakes. Yeah. I think one of the biggest ones was, I think, not going home a year earlier when my wife wanted me to. <laughs> um, she was struggling with their kids and with, with, our, with our kids and stuff. Um, and I should have gone home earlier. I was just, as you said, I was afraid to leave the business. Yeah. Thought it wouldn't work. But obviously, I was wrong. Yeah. Got, I've learned to trust people now. And it's, it's not all me. Yeah, yeah. That, that makes sense. That makes sense. That must have been tough, like a year with the family away. Yeah, it was very tough. Um, I, w- I would say like long distance relationships. Yeah. Well, we had three kids, so we had to make it work. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it, it can be difficult. Um, I get very bored in the evenings. Um, I don't like sitting around on my own. Like at home now, I've got my garden and I've got the kids. Anyone who's got kids, they know you've got piano, you've got rugby, yeah. you've got soccer, all that kind of stuff. So it keeps me busy. I like to keep busy. Yeah. Um, and sometimes when you're on your own, it's difficult to find how to keep busy. Yeah, that, that is very true. I, I'm a living testament. <laughs> so <laughs> so let, let me take you back. So what brought you to Bahrain in the first place? Wow. Okay. So I wanted to set up in the Middle East when we came over here first from Ireland. Okay. Um, but I didn't know where we wanted Why to Why the Middle up. East? Like, what was the attraction? Is it just the, <laughs> the tax-free factor? Or what, no, what was it? it was nothing to do with tax-free factor. It was just when the recession happened here... Dubai and the Middle East were still really, really busy. When you're talking about the recession, you're talking about the financial crisis, yes. the property yes. crisis, right? Yeah, 2008, yeah. around that time. Is that so when I, you came here? Yeah, so I remember coming over here to, uh, well, to Dubai, an exhibition in Dubai, and I came over, I signed a load of contracts, I was so excited, I went home, I was getting everything ready to come back again, and then two weeks later, Dubai crashed. Yeah. I was like going, oh, where am I going to go now? Yeah. But I found Saudi Arabia kind of kept really busy. They didn't really have the crash as bad as everywhere else. Um, and I didn't think Saudi was a place I want to set up a business because I wanted, I, like if you see the business here, it's mainly um, females in the office. I do think in recruitment, I, I think in, on average, they're better, they're more patient, they're more empathetic with people. Yeah, and, and they can do multiple tasks at the same <laughs> time. <laughs> That's it. So for to do that, I think setting up a recruitment company to run in uh, Riyadh or Saudi, uh, setting it up from Dubai isn't the greatest option. Yeah. So we came to Bahrain and we found it such easy access. The Saudis communicate with the Bahrainis a lot easier. So that's how I ended up in Bahrain, really. But did you come here like as a job initially or you came to set up? No, I came to set up. Okay, so you didn't have a job here first. No, I had nothing. I had no company. I just about had a company name three days before I came over. Oh, no way. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I came over completely blindfolded. Thought and you knew gonna... Barry, like you came with yeah, Barry together? Barry and I had uh, used to work together about four years previous to that. In one. Ireland? In Ireland, yeah. That's okay. Right. So Barry and I go back a long time. Okay. Yeah. So then one day you guys were like... Let's go to the Middle East. That was more, kind of, yeah, more or less, that was it. Uh, we came over here, as I said, we got the company named three or four days before, got the domain set up and just said, look, I know Barry can work hard. I know I can work yeah. hard. I know failure doesn't mean a lot to me. It's just like, come on, let's do it again. Let's do it again. Yeah. If you keep doing it and it's not working, stop failing, find a new way. Yeah. Um, so that's where, and like Barry is a great motivator for me. Um, I love going out talking to people. I love driving up business. I love doing BD. 
But sometimes, like even the best DB, BD people, they need a bit of guidance and a bit yeah. of a push. Yeah. And I think that's where Barry comes in and he's helping yeah. out a lot. Over so is he the that. more grounded one? He is more, more the, so. The, 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 more the, the back end person. guy and you're the... Yeah. Just yeah. Go, go sell some stuff. I'm just going and blag it and see what happens. <laughs> 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 Everyone needs a blagger. <laughs> I, I think that, that makes a great partnership, by the way. It having, does. Yes. Having the structured, organized one and having the social blagger, yeah. outgoing one. Sales guy. Yeah. Sales guy, sales guy. Yeah, yeah. It has, look, we're, I'm sitting here in front of you today. Yeah. I've opened up an office in Sydney there two months ago. We've got an office in India. We've got here and we've got Ireland. So the two of us have done that over the How fast did that happen? So the India, Sydney? Because um, you've just been going like... Building from strength to strength. I know, yeah. It's this new product we have, Rent a Recruiter, is just really out the door. Um, it's a new servicing off- offering we're doing. Instead of just doing a placement in a company and you send an yeah. invoice, we're going, look, let's help you. Yeah. Let's wear your struggles. Let us come in. We know what recruitment means. So we can go into companies now and say, look, you're struggling here. Let us help you. Yeah. Let us not come in and just fire three CVs in you and hope for the best. Let's figure out your struggles. Let's work through your struggles. And then when we leave you in three months or 12 months or whatever it is, we give you everything we taught you, and then you can call us again if you need us. If not, that's probably better because we've done our job right. Okay, now. amazing. But so, how does one go about setting up in India randomly? You don't live in India. No, I haven't. I, I actually haven't been to India yet. You've never been to India. Okay, yeah. so that's even more interesting. So, so how do you, how do you go about our, doing that? <coughs> excuse me. One of our senior recruiters here, uh, Nofo, with this is about five years, um, and his wife wants him to go home. He's a child at home. He's like, look is it okay that I do a month at home and a month back here? And I had moved home for family reasons, so I was quite empathetic towards the whole thing. So I was just like, look, why don't you just move home to India, set up an office of close to where you live? And he goes, yeah. what? And I was like, well, look, it's not great traveling back and forth with family. I know that. So I said, look, why don't you go over for six months, see you get on, see if you can set up an office over there. And if you can, brilliant. If not, we'll figure something out after. Um, luckily, I had the confidence in Ufa, and Nofa, like, knew he'd do well. So Nofa's been home now, I think it's nearly two years. He's actually arriving today. I haven't okay. seen him for two okay. years. He's actually coming over today. And he's just done really, really well. He's got an office. He's got a team there. So it's going brilliant. So he's built it up yeah, over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So th- that's, that's crazy. So, like, like, I assume India's a super competitive country with a billion people and I'm sure like thousands. It is super competitive but I think where Nofa lives it's not in a big city so he's just it's a quiet enough area and he's found a good couple of recruiters that were working in the big cities but they wanted to move home for family reasons as yeah. well. So we've actually been able to attract them so it's worked out quite well for that, us that's so far. Amazing, amazing. So it sounds like you're always finding great people, yeah. giving them that leadership, yeah. that ownership. That's and just it. let them do their thing. Yeah, well, the guidance as well. You have to make sure that you're there for guidance with everyone. I think because the Australia office we've just set up there in January, um, the girl I know over there, Jessica, I know her years. She's done really well. But they do, I think people, I think if you give people too much responsibility, sometimes they get a little bit freaked out. Yeah. So I have to make sure that I'm on top of that and make sure that I'm there to help them give them guidance, teach them what I know. Yeah. I've learned over the years, no point keeping secrets. Do you know what I mean? You know what? I completely yeah. agree with that. I mean, I mean, people love to keep secrets yeah. because they think like that's their secret source. And if you, if everyone finds out about it, then they're not going to be hired or they're not going to like, you know. That's it. Do you know what I mean? But it's yeah. so important for me that everyone knows what I've learned over the years. Yeah. Like I'm doing recruitment 18 years now. So I've learned a lot. Do you know what I mean? And I don't find any reason in keeping that information to myself. Do you know what I mean? Hence, as you see, I sit out in the office. I don't have a closed door policy. I don't even have a door. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, it is is quite important to me that I pass on my knowledge and I try and make the team and whatever business it is help each other out. Because I know some recruitment companies are there to get a kind of CV. They want to keep it to them. The CVs. Share, yeah, they don't want to share the knowledge. They're, I want to place this person. Yeah. Well, I've gotten rid of all that in the business. It's everyone's out to help everybody because I think that's how Sangeeta taught me to grow a business. Yeah. She's there, look, we got to be more of a team. we got to be more together. And I was there, okay, cool, look, you do it. And she proved me wrong. She proved me wrong quite a bit, actually. But it's good <laughs> to learn from that. No, that's amazing. That's amazing. So let's talk about the recruitment business. So you come to the Middle East. Yeah. How do you go about getting your first few clients? Just phone calls. So you do what most recruiters do, really. You find out who's advertising, find what companies have won big projects. Um, you try and find out decision makers in those companies and just go in and say, look, I'm the same. I'm better than everyone else, but I'm the same. And just go from there. But you have to, 
you have to prove it because like there I, I a lot of HR people I speak to they say look you're the 50th person in here this year yeah um, you've got to prove you're, you're, you're what you say you are so you can't just go off and send three CVs and hope for the best you've really got to work with the client I think the more you can communicate with the client the more you learn of what they want yeah um, that makes your job easier and then in turn you make their job easier because I don't think clients I think the reason clients come to recruit and come and see is because well, first of all, they can't build a position themselves, but to go to a good one, because there are recruitment companies out there that will send 100 CVs in for a job, and there, that's a waste of clients' time. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So Might as well post a job yourself. Do you know what I mean? My <laughs> so my whole point is we got to take the, we got to give the client his, time, his or her time back, so we got to get this right. So if we get something in, if the client's not happy, I'll actually try and meet the client or have a meeting with the client, figure out exactly what they are looking for, just so we can get it right the next time. Yeah, that's amazing. So that's what I was sort of wanted to know. Like, what is that sales pitch going into the? So I assume the HR manager is the decision maker in your industry. Um, some of them, yeah. So I think sometimes we do better with line managers. Um, HR managers, it's not really recruitment's their area, so they want to do their own stuff. Yeah. So for someone like myself or a business like ours to come along and say, "Look, we'll take that away from you." There's also a lot of companies now of talent acquisition managers or talent managers or recruitment managers. Um, going up to them and just figuring out where they need help. So I will start, before I used to start a meeting going, all right, what's your busiest job? What can I work on? Yeah, I'll get CVs for you. But now with the new recruiter model we're doing, rent a recruiter, I sit down with the client, I sit down for half an hour, maybe an hour, and go, look, where are you falling down? Where are your weaknesses? Mm -hmm. um, and they say, oh, I don't know. And you'll have a good chat with them, and you'll go, look, I think this is where you need help. And he goes, yeah, maybe it is. And you'll say, look, let me see if we can help you there. I have a good recruiter that says such and such and such. Let's put them in your company for a month and then you can let me know what you think after a month and then we go from there. Yeah. So far, it's worked out really well. We yeah. haven't had any client complaints in the last 14 months uh, with rent a recruiter. So we do push it, but it's, it's a lot of management. It's not just getting a recruiter and hoping for the best. Like It's daily checkups with the recruiter, making sure they're happy, making sure they're on top of things making sure they understand the client's yeah. needs and wants. Um, sometimes we're dealing directly with line managers now, which we didn't used to get in the past too much. So that's brilliant as well. So yeah. it's all changing of recruitment, okay. I think. So, it's, so it's more of recruitment as a service than recruitment as a placement. Yeah, yeah. I got it, got it, which is an interesting model. Um, are your clients, even in the placement uh, business, um, are they like, tend to be loyal, like, like, or do they give the same job to like every recruitment company out there and hope for the best? Like whoever um, places first. On average, in the past, no, there was no loyalty. It's like first come, first over, the best CV. But with the new rent and recruiter service now... So it's, it's like, almost like the real estate business. Like yeah. whoever can yeah, yeah, yeah. sell the whoever house. finds me the nicest house yeah. I'll buy. Yeah, I don't okay. care who finds it first. Okay. Yeah, but it's changed now because we're embedding our team into the business. Like some of them, they do still deal with other recruitment companies, but we help them deal with those recruitment companies. Um, we'll show them how to get more out of other recruitment companies. Because some of our clients like are trying to fill 3,000 jobs in a yeah. year. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. for, I'd love to say we can do it, but you do need external help at that. So we teach our clients how to get the best out of other agencies okay. if they want to still deal with them after. Preferences for not to deal with us out, for them with after, but look, it's a business world and I don't think we're going to change the world today, but I do think we've made a big step of helping clients out and making their lives easier. Amazing. Do you interview every single person you place? Or is that oh, not yeah, a yeah, thing? Oh, yeah, yeah, totally. We would never send a candidate over to a client without pre-screening. 100%. But I, but I feel like there are other, some, I mean, let's not mention names, but like there are most recruitment companies that I came across, in Bahrain, I mean, don't really interview. They just like connect you with the job. Yeah, no, no, no. We have a <laughs> prerequisite here. No one's allowed to do that. So none of our clients will get a CV without one of, the, one of our teams speaking to them at least once before sending yeah. it forward. Look, it's important for us because, look, a client's come to me and said, I, I need this, this, and this. And only half of what the client wants is on the CV. The other half is in the candidate's head. So yeah. I got to find out, right, on paper the candidate's right, but is this what the client, is this is he or she what the client wants? And you have a chat and you'd be surprised how many people I don't send to the client after. Okay. Uh, yeah, you've got to make sure that the right person, like one person might do one client and the another person might do another client. You know, not every CV is perfect for every yeah. client. It's, it's down to the personality of the person as well. See, I, I've, I always found like looking at it on the flip side from a candidate's point of view, and I, I find it a bit frustrating, like, you know, when you see all these job uh, listings on LinkedIn or on other websites, yeah. and you're always just seeing the recruitment company, and yeah. so you have no idea what company you're actually applying for. 
yeah. you know what the job is because they'll just be like a financial company yeah, well, is we, looking for we, A, B, C, D, E. And like, we stopped doing that. We stopped you doing stopped that. doing yeah, that? You yeah, actually yeah. mentioned so, the client name. Um, yeah, so any client we're working with now in Rental Recruiter, we usually will be under we'll be under that client, so we'll be a part of. Oh no, that's the renter recruiter model. Yeah. I'm talking about the traditional model. The traditional model, yeah, it is. It's stuck. We completely walked away. From are, the are they worried model. about like the com- like are the competitor knowing who the client is? Yeah, because what happens is sometimes <laughs> the candidate goes straight to the client themselves, and yeah. then the recruitment company will lose out in a fee. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. See, but, but see, that that's the thing, right? So, like, when I was looking at it, and I'm like, okay. So obviously in Australia, the same thing, you know, yeah. it's mostly like the actual clients don't advertise directly. So most job listings are through recruitment companies. You have no idea where the job is, right? And then you're like, okay, but I know when I'm sending a CV, there's probably 10,000 other people sending a CV. Yeah, that can so happen, how yeah. do I actually get through? You know, this is why like, you know, why it's this it? filter mechanism because yeah. I, I can pretty much bet that you guys don't look at every single CV that lands for a job. Do you, know, do you know, <laughs> up till about three years ago, every CV that I got emailed, I'd always check. Always check. I always thought it was fair enough to the person. Now, I didn't get back to them, um, but I always thought if someone spent the time to write up a CV and send in, they're obviously interested in some job. So I always gave them the respect. I've always read every CV that's ever come across my desk. That's if they send it to you directly. I'm talking yeah. about responses to job listings where you end up getting like, I mean, look, for job me, for my own business, like, you know, when I'm looking for someone, I'll put up yeah. a job ad. Yeah. And then I'll get like a thousand. I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to go through the thousand. Yeah, but on all the job sites now, you can put filters. Do you know what I mean? Certain prerequisites that the client has wanted. So when those CVs are sent out of those thousands, those questions narrow it down to about 50 or 100. And then I will go through those 50 or 100 CVs. Yeah. But my best thing for anyone sending their CV into a recruitment company is call the recruitment company when they send the CV in. Directly. Don't just hope for the best. Yeah. Look, if you really want the job, ring the recruiter. Find out where the job is, find out more about the business. Because I guarantee you, if a recruiter has your CV in front of them and you ring them, they will talk to you, they will tell you all about the business. If they don't tell you all about the job, probably best not to go with that recruiter. Yeah, see, because that's what I always thought, you know? Like, it's like you almost want to put a voice and a face to your paper CV. Yeah. And I think, like, now the world's kind of changing as well. Um, yeah, videos video are becoming yeah, a yeah, thing. Yeah. We do video interviews, we do video job specs now. Uh, we got the clients to do their video, their job spec, read it out to people. Yeah. Um, it's more of a personal thing. Uh, you get video CVs now, all that. But I think technology will only go so far. Yeah. You do need a bit of human interaction there yeah. again. And I would always suggest anyone, anyone looking for a job, if you really want it, don't just ping your CV out everywhere. Concentrate on what you're applying to. Make a note of the agencies you're going to. And do follow up with the agency, definitely. I know, I know in the past there's been a couple of CVs maybe I wouldn't have put forward. But then the candidate calls me and they're going, ah, maybe I was wrong there. Maybe this is the right person. Yeah. So always make that phone call. Make I that would contact. Suggest that would be my biggest thing. Yeah, always make that phone call to the recruiter and yeah. make sure they understand who you are. Because a CV is a two-page document. It doesn't sell your life experience. Yeah. Or, or know your personality. No. And that's it. And, and that, that is the most important thing. Yeah. So how important is a cover letter? Or is that not important anymore? I, I, you know, like they say, person, you should be so specific to that job, etc. It's a personal opinion. Um, me, personally, I don't know if I should be saying this, but I'm not big into cover letters. No. I, I, I don't think people know how to sell themselves well on paper. It's very difficult. It is very difficult. Yeah. I can't do it, and I'm talking loads here. Yeah. Um, I, I, always, I think instead of the cover letter is ring the recruiter. Ring the recruiter, or if you're applying directly to the company, try and get in touch with the HR manager or something. Like, yeah. follow up and don't just hope for the best. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. so you're saying this cover letter is an old thing. Yeah, yeah. I, in, no, in, the past, no. in the past, there was a big emphasis no. on it. Don't, don't quote me in this, but like, <laughs> I, I do know some of my team out there are big into cover letters, so I'd like to see and get to understand the person more. So yeah. sometimes I'm right, sometimes I'm wrong. As I said, I'm not always right. Yeah. Uh, but personal is, I would rather speak to a person rather than read their cover letter. Yeah, makes sense. So I assume like now with all this COVID stuff, because everyone's doing meetings online anyway, yeah. has this made your life a lot easier? Uh, yes and no. Yes and um, no. In Ireland, we work, we're still fully remote because of COVID. Um, I miss the office interaction, but I'm quite good. Like I will call the team two or three times a week over Zoom. I'm going to get a proper team meeting. I'll always finish up the end of the week, the last meeting on a Thursday evening. It'll be a fun game. It won't be a meeting talking about how your week was. It's literally a bit of crack. 20 minutes, half an hour, maybe it's a quiz, maybe it's a scavenger hunt they have to do in their house. I think 
you have to understand that everyone works hard um, and it ha- can't always be meetings. It can't always be a meeting. You yeah. need to have a bit of crack. And the fact that we're not in the office having the crack during the day, it's really important to do that. I think for speaking to candidates, um, it's, it is easier. Before, it was always telephone calls or you're trying to arrange to meet the candidate. But now you can actually do it um, over a video so you get a better understanding of facial reaction and get yeah. to read a person better. Yeah, okay. So would you say, what is the main skill uh, someone should have to be a great recruitment consultant? Patience. Patience. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say patience, empathy is really, really important. Um, and get up and go, because like, you're going to get a lot of knockbacks in recruitment. Like people, you're dealing with people, and people always let you down. They don't mean to, but they do. People let you down. Like You could be working on a job for three months, and then you're there, the candidate's starting tomorrow, and then the client calls you tomorrow and says, where's the candidate? And you're there, I don't know, they ghosted me, and they're gone forever. Yeah. Um, so patience empathy and a good work ethic good craft and work ethic okay. i remember i remember like my first job in australia and i was like i hated this job and like it was a recruitment company that sort of deceived me into that direction <laughs> because like my job interview which i thought was the job right it wasn't actually a job interview it was the recruitment uh company's interview yeah and they almost did it like the apprentice you know so you get like it was a group session, like 30 people, all fresh grads, and they're making different activities and teamwork and like whatever, and then like monitoring you. And then at the end, they split you up into two rooms. So like, if you're in this room, then you passed. And the people who were in the other room, they failed. And did they know that? We, we know, we find out at the end, right? And, and, and the guy was like, fantastic. I remember like the actual, uh, the recruitment <laughs> consultant, pro- like probably one of the best salespeople I know, like very good talker. Yeah. So I thought this was for the company. And then they're like, no, okay, so now you've passed. So now we can pass you on to the actual company, like, you know, place you in different uh, places. And the first job I got, like, I was like, the the guy that was interviewing me was like, you're going to hate this job, right? This is like, he's like, you're overqualified for this job. I'm like, you know, how can I be overqualified? I'm like 22, 23. (laughs) But I had a lot of bullshit on my CV. So like, you know. (laughs) And he's like, he's like, you're gonna find it really boring. I'm like, well, to be honest, I was just broke. I needed a job. Like the first job I get. Yeah, yeah. Just take take the first job you get, you know. And I had basically in this job, it was a sales job for a conference. They 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 sold tickets to conferences. Okay. Probably the most like genius uh, idea ever because there is no conference until you sell the tickets. Yeah. And then when you sell the tickets, then they'll go hire the guy and r- rent a little room and make a conference. Oh, I used to do that. I remember my, <laughs> my first real job in London after finishing uni, um, worked for a company called the Cobra Group, and it was door to door sales on a hundred percent commission. Okay. I did that for three years, and that taught me a lot. Did you make good money? I did, like, as you may have told, I'm a good talker, so, yeah, yeah um, but I'm, I am also empathetic, so that does stand to any good business development man who's person, man or woman who's empathetic, it does make a difference. Wait, were you, were you, what were you selling? Empire, gas and electric. Gas and electric. Was it an easy sell, or was it, was it for them yeah, to switch companies? Yes, yeah, switch companies, switch providers. Okay. Um, yeah, it was hard. It's hard. <laughs> Even on the rainy, cold days, you couldn't. Because you're on 100% commission, so you, like, it was either that or you don't pay your rent. Yeah. So I had to keep going. And yeah, that learned a lot. And then I moved home to Ireland, and I actually went into Barry yeah. um, to say, look, I'm looking for a job as an architectural technologist. That's what I did in university. And Barry interviewed me, and then I started working for him three weeks later. So you actually met Barry was the guy who interviewed you. That's how you guys met. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Barry interviewed me for a job for another business, and then offered me a job with him at the time. Yeah. Uh, so that's where your history goes that's back where to. We, that's how we met. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah By yeah. the way, you know this door to door thing. I tried it for one day in Australia. First job again, twenty two years old. Thinking this is, the, they're like, we're going to go sell to businesses. Yeah, man, like, those they, companies are they so adver- good at getting you on board. They advertise it like you're working in some corporate yeah. city place. Yeah, 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 and yeah. I'm in my thick suit, my I tie answer, and I everything. the same ad, but it was in London. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> and they're like, all right, guys, let's go. I'm like, where are we going? Yeah, because the ad looks so cool because you're a young kid. And you're just like going, yeah. oh, my God. Like, I can actually ring my dad and yeah. have something yeah. real yeah. for once. They, they called it marketing. Yeah. And it's then you sales, but they call it a marketing I'm job. I'm sure it was the same company. And then you go out <laughs> and then they do this big meeting. You're like, oh, this is great. And then you start walking down the road. And you're like, where are we going? Mate, we're going knocking We're going to the car. Day. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we, go, we all get in these vans. Exactly. Go to some random neighborhoods. Yeah. I'm wearing this, it's peak Australian summer. And I'm oh, wearing this winter, my only suit I had. Yeah. It's so hot. And they're like, all right, let's go. I was like, where are we going? Yeah. And I see the guy knocking on the door and I'm like, what are you doing? 
<laughs> yeah, they don't tell you anything. And then I remember when I was doing that because I used to take people out as well. And you'd be walking down the road sometimes, you turn around and they go, Where are they gone? They, they ran. Literally, people used to roam and they Mate, I, I was like, How do I get out of here? I'm in the middle of nowhere, some random suburb. It's so hot. Yeah. The van's not coming back till six o'clock. There's no public transport around me. And this, you're talking about the days before Uber and any yeah, of that yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're that old. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, You just go knock on the door. Would you like to save the rainforest? <laughs> I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think. I, I got I, I got such a buzz out of it my first day. This is something I love doing. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm chatting to people all day and I'm going to get paid for it. Yeah. They're brilliant. And then I actually became really good. I enjoyed it so much. I think with any sales job, if you don't enjoy it, you're not going to be... You're going to hate it. You're going to hate your life. It. Yeah, you're not going to put in the effort. But if you like it, I know it sounds weird, man, knocking on doors for a living, but I actually did enjoy it for three years and then I stopped knocking on doors and said, oh, I'll never do that again. <laughs> <laughs> but it must have taught you a lot, though, along it did. the way. It taught me loads. It did. I remember when I started, I used to complain about everything. Everything wasn't right. If I had a bad day, it was everyone else's fault. But I learned one of my bosses, Simon, at the time, whenever I come back in, he'd be there going, I only want to hear positives. Don't tell me the negatives. I faced them all myself. I yep. don't want to be repeated them. Yep. I was there going, you're right, you know that. And then I learned from that. And that was one of my biggest learning lessons, I think, when I was younger. Because people don't want to hear about the bad stuff. Yeah, they no one want does. to hear about the good stuff. Mm. So work harder to make more good stuff happen so you have more to talk about. <laughs> I mean, exactly, exactly. Well, Jamie, it's been an absolute pleasure it's having you on the podcast. Seeing you again, man. And you I, too. Yeah, it's been a pleasure having a chat. You Thanks too. And again. like, congratulations on everything you guys have done. Thanks very much. I hope uh, it keeps going the same direction. I hope so. I'll be praying for you. Thanks a lot, Perfect. Jamie. Thanks, man.